I actually have an urge to invite our choir members to come up and lead us in <laughs> shout. Those who don't know the inside joke, many of our choir members uh, participated in the Garth Brooks concert last night in the community chorus that uh, led the rendition of, of Shout that made so famous from uh, Animal House that has become a staple of Oregon football games. And if you read the, the, the newspaper this morning, a story about Robert Bailey that was part of the Otis, uh, what was his name, the band from Animal House, um, he talked about singing here at this church back in the 70s. Um, and uh, the picture uh, showed, uh, they were standing right here and showed the banner that uh, um, one of our members made. And uh, it's just wonderful to read. It, who, who would have known that First Christian Church would play a role in supporting the number one country western singer, you know, in the nations? <laughs> Church for all people, like I like to say, right? So last Sunday, uh, it actually fits with the sermon today. Last Sunday, I began a mini sermons on uh, Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. And uh, we're taking one chapter each Sunday, so I invite you to read it on your own. It won't hurt you. It's, some, you know, it's a good thing once in a while, read the Bible at home. Um, and so now we're on uh, chapter two. Now, I'm not going to read the whole chapter. I'm just picking out some highlights. But keep in mind, as we go through this, this is the very first thing in the Christian faith written down that has survived, that, that, that we know of. Uh, this is the first witness uh, to the Christian faith, written probably a good 20 years before the first gospel uh, was written. So, reading then from chapter 2, verses uh, 5 through 8. As you know, as God is our witness, we never came with words of flattery or with a pretext for greed, nor did we seek praise from mortals, whether from you or from others, though we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nurse tenderly caring for her own children. So deeply do we care for you, that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you have become very dear to us. And I lift up these particular verses this morning because I think they contain a key principle that is fundamental to Paul's message and to the entire gospel. That principle we might call the nature of Christian love, and it's articulated very well in that last verse, so deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel, but also our very selves. Paul goes on to say later in chapter 4 that there's no need for anyone to write to the Thessalonians about uh, how to love one another because they have already learned how to love each other as brothers and sisters because they have been, quote, taught by God to love one another. So how is it that this community so early in, in the tradition of Christian faith has been taught by God? And I think we see a possibility of an answer to that question in the way Paul uses this very evocative image that describes how he and his co-authors worked among that community when he says, we were as gentle as a nurse tenderly caring for her own children. The contemporary English version uh, translates it even better. Uh, there it says, we were like a mother nursing her own baby. And that is a very powerful image. And it is, by the way, of course, one that Jesus uses himself. If you remember uh, in that lament over Jerusalem when Jesus says, how I have desired to gather your children like a hen gathering her brood under her wings. And then recall the prophet Hosea. Now, he describes the feelings of God for her people, and she says, I was like those who lift infants to their cheeks. I bent down to them and fed them. And I use here and she here not to be cute, but quite intentionally, because that is the image. It's a very feminine, feminine one, the image of a mother bending over to nurse her baby. And later on in that same passage, uh, God says through the prophet Hosea, my compassion grows warm and tender. And many of you Bible stu students know that the Hebrew word for compassion is derived from the word womb. And I think Hosea uses that word quite intentionally to suggest that the fundamental character of God is like a mother's womb from whence we are born. And James Weldon Johnson um, expressed it so well in that beautiful creation poem in the climactic moment when God creates the first human being and he tells us that God knelt down by the banks of the river and takes that lump of clay and then 
the almighty God who lit the stars and flung them in the sky, who set the sun blazing in the sky, who, who rounded the earth in the middle of his hand, this great God, like a mammy bending over her baby, breathed into it the breath of life. It's a beautiful, powerful image. When I was in Albuquerque uh, back in March um, to hear Richard Rohr and Dominic Crossan, they had in, on display the artwork of Janet McKenzie, who also spoke at one of the plenary sessions. And Janet is relatively, at that time, was unknown to the world, though she does beautiful work. And by the way, that's the artwork on the front cover of our bulletin. Um, and then the National Catholic Reporter issued a call for a new image of Jesus to commemorate the year 2000. And Janet's artwork was chosen among the 1,700 that were submitted. Now, Janet has a, or had at the time, a 15-year-old nephew of mixed race who wore dreadlocks. And so she wanted to create an image of Jesus with which he could identify. This is what she created. She calls it Jesus of the people. What do you think? So uh, she used a young woman as her model, and she wanted to, in some way, create an image that was both masculine and feminine, that anyone could, could see themselves in that image. Um, well. It was unveiled for the first time on the Today Show. And the response was immediate and fierce. She received volumes of hate mail, death threats. The infamous Westboro, Westboro Baptist Church uh, threatened to boycott her studio. Her neighbors came to her defense and uh, even offered to uh, patrol um, her place uh, with guns if needed, and she said, no, thank you. Um, for three years, Janet went on tour with nothing but this painting, and she said everywhere she went, someone would come and just stand before that painting with tears coming down their cheeks. They would openly weep, and frequently she would have someone tell her, you know, I have a good friend or a family member that, that is a spitting twin of that image. And then when she would be introduced to this person, the first time she said it was this fat Chinese man who didn't look anything like it. And then it was a Native American woman. And then it was a queer white man. And over and over again, these people that identified with this image in such powerful ways could see themselves in it. It's a very powerful thing. Uh, later, several years later, she was uh, commissioned to paint um, the Holy Family. And in studying other um, paintings, she was struck by how often Joseph is portrayed as standing apart from Mary, in the background, you know, like he's not really part of this family. And I, I love particularly this last image, if you can see it, to, you know, baby Jesus is like, who is this guy? Get me away from him, right? You know, and you look at his scowl on his face. I mean, not exactly a loving image of a father. Well, so this is the image um, that she painted with Jesus very much a part, uh, very intimate. She wanted to show the feminine nature, the nurturing nature of men in, in this image. Um, I think this is a, a, a good representation of the image that Paul has in mind, of the nurturing love of God that Paul calls us to emulate. Ultimately, the love that we are called to share is derived from that love that we receive from birth, right, in which we are nurtured. And when we share such love with one another, we share the love of God. And so Paul uses the image of a mother with her child to describe the depth of his love and care for that community in Thessalonica. And so it is then through that kind of example that we learn the love of God. And of course, that extends beyond family, beyond the boundaries of those who raised us. Last Sunday, I cited the example of the woman who described her experience of coming into ch church for the first time as being conquered by love. And from my own experience, I would say that having seen people come and go in church, 
There's a difference between those who join because they make a connection of the mind, right? That's intellectual, they like what they hear. And those who join because they make a connection of the heart, they like what they feel and the way that it makes them feel. And ideally, of course, we would do both in church. But when our connection is more from the heart rather from the mind, it's, it's at a deeper level. Uh, I th the wonderful illustration, I think, of that is the incredible relationship between uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Anthony Scalia, you know, two members of the Supreme Court who could not have been farther apart ideologically, and yet they had this incredible friendship. We are much more apt to make a lifelong commitment that's not going to change, right? When you hear the preacher say something you don't like, not that that ever happens here, of course, right? Or somebody does something that offends you. Like the experience I had once in a church I served in Fresno, I went to call on a woman who dropped out. And um, come to find out, uh, she was deeply offended because in the process of preparing communion, uh, another woman told her, a woman told her that she was filling the cups too full. Well, that'll do it, <laughs> right? And the, the irony was that this uh, accused woman she was complaining about was one of the saints of the church, one of the, the most deeply loved members of that congregation. But you see, when you have that deep heart-to-heart -heart connection, like a mother to her children, then you work through those kinds of issues and challenges because your love for each other is greater than any kind of difference or disagreement. And that's the kind of love that we are called to model and to share with one another. It's the kind of love that I think people are looking for when they come to church. They want to know if we're gonna be like that which Paul describes, loving one another as a mother or a father loves their children. And that kind of love begins with a deeper understanding of Christian hospitality. We, think, we tend to think of hospitality, of, of the things we do to make the church friendlier, more welcoming, which is, of course, a good thing. I learned from a, a new couple in church years ago that they had this test. Uh, they'd been church shopping, and they said, where we go to a church and find that we are greeted by at least 10% of the people, well, then we'll go back, right? To think about that, do we pass it? And, and they said, and it doesn't count when the preacher says, now greet one another. She says, that doesn't count. Do we pass that test? Well, in this particular time, we did, and they came back. That's a good thing. When I was in Greece, I visited a church in Philippi, and came a bit late, and obviously I was a visitor. I didn't speak the language. I didn't dress like them. I couldn't follow the liturgy at all. But they had a coffee hour afterwards, just like any church, with coffee and goodies, and I went and had my coffee and my cookies, and I waited, and I waited, and I waited. And not one person spoke to me. I got the message of who, you know, this church was for. When I was in Bethlehem back in 2003, I visited three families in their homes, relatives of my friends, Ibrahim Hamida. You've heard me tell this story. Each one of those families welcomed me as if I was some long lost relative of theirs and, right, and served me wonderful food and drink, just made me feel at home. And of course, each of those families are Muslim. There's nothing particularly unique, um, you know, in Christian faith to hospitality. Hospitality in the, in the Middle Eastern tradition is about offering space to a guest, a guest who can even be a stranger, be it a space at a table, a space in the home, a space in the inn, or when the inn is full, in the barn out back. Right? That Bethlehem story is a story of hospitality, right? That that innkeeper could not turn that young couple away, had to find space for them, because that's the tradition. In Bethlehem, you do not turn away strangers. When the end is full, you find space. The great spiritual director, Henri Nouwen, says, the hospitality we are called to create is that kind that offers space where change can occur, space for God to work in the life of the other person, space even for God to be born in our lives, in our midst. Diana Butler Bass says, for Christians, hospitality holds special significance. Christians welcome strangers as we ourselves have been welcomed into God through the love of Jesus Christ. And such hospitality, welcoming strangers, is transformative for the giver and the receiver of light because it creates 
that kind of sacred space where God can work. So in that book that I cited last Sunday, and many of you have read, Christianity for the Rest of Us, she tells the story of the Epiphany Episcopal Church in Washington, D.C., just a couple of blocks from the White House. You know this story. You know it well. The church is not a lot bigger than ours. Um, and like us, they have two services. And between the services one morning, they offered a breakfast for their church leaders. Only typical of church, they prepared too much food. And so they invited some of the folk who they know knew had nothing to eat that morning to come and join them. Well, guess what? Next Sunday, those folk came back, and they brought friends. <laughs> and so they scrambled, you know, found some food in the kitchen, and they put on another breakfast, and lo and behold, a ministry was born. And it was that ministry that became the inspiration for our Sunday breakfast. Only because their breakfast is between their two services, they had quite a few number of folk who, uh, coming early, would just come to their worship service. And before long, they discovered they had more homeless in their first service than they had members. And they decided, well, you know, homeless folk uh, don't have a lot of money. We don't want to ask anything of them, so we shouldn't take an offering. Only those new members, they called them members without an address, said, no, we don't want to be treated any differently than anyone else. So they went ahead and took the offering. And one of their lifelong members recalled how he felt the first time that he served as a deacon in that service. And he told Diana Butler Bass, as the plate passed down the rows, I watched poor people turn their pockets inside out and throw loose change and crumpled dollars in the offering. I almost cried. I learned more about giving that morning than in a thousand sermons. And you see, that's the power of hospitality. When we out welcome others, regardless of who they are, what they look like, what language they speak, it's transformative. Years ago, on a Sunday right after Thanksgiving, in the first service, uh, then, which was our new celebration service, uh, I had just started to preach when I noticed three people come in the door who were dressed in their Halloween outfits. A woman was wearing chaps, and apparently not a whole lot else underneath, because I just know I saw more than I wanted to see when she turned and walked the other way in the aisle, right? And the folks who were here that morning will never forget. Um, well, I noticed as I was preaching, everyone was looking over there, right? And. I said, I had this line, swear to God, in the sermon, right? I didn't change anything. And I said, that's the power of hospitality. We welcome others regardless of who they are, what they look like, what language they speak, or how they dress. And I thought, my God, what am I saying, right? <laughs> and there was this loud amen from over there, right? That's right, brother. People accuse me of paying them to do that, to test you. Uh, it was quite a test, and you passed. To do that, to welcome people regardless, you see, of who they are, what they look like, and how they even dress, to create that kind of sacred space where the power of God's transforming love can work. Now, I'm certain they came because they thought they were going to get a reaction out of us. And to think about the message that they took away, where they were welcomed. I mean, we don't know what impact that had, right? In the closing statements of the Democratic uh, debate, and the second one, uh, I don't know if you watched, um, I thought the comments of author Marianne Williamson were right on. I don't know why she's running for president. I'm not endorsing her, uh, right? But, but she talked about the politics of fear versus the power of love. And I wish more of our candidates would not only talk about such power, but put that kind of power into practice. And I was struck in that book by Diana Butler Bass of the story of Finney Ridge Lutheran Church in Seattle. That's one of those places where they host the tent city um, in Seattle that moves every three months. And they, they hosted it on the front lawn of their church, in part because they wanted to be that kind of welcoming congregation, and also because they wanted to make a public statement on the need of the community to respond to the crisis um, that they have. But what struck me as Diana Butler Bass was telling the story was she told it not once, but she told it twice. 
She told it in her chapter on the, the spiritual practice of hospitality, and she told it in her chapter on the spiritual practice of justice. And it got me to thinking, how are acts of hospitality are acts also of justice? And remember the words of Jesus, right? In Matthew 25, in that story, The Last Judgment, I was hungry and you fed me, I was naked and you clothed me. Is that an act of hospitality or an act of justice? Or just two sides of the same coin? John Dominic Crossan says, to claim that God has already begun to transform this earth into a place of divine justice and peace, as Paul later on says in this letter to the Thessalonians. To do that demands that you can show something of that transformative activity here and now, to which Paul would have replied unabashedly, to see God's transformation in process, come and see how we live. So can we say that? To see God's transformation in process, come and see how we live as a Christian community. And I think that's what made Paul's preaching so powerful. Speaking to those Gentile communities in the Roman Empire, that he could say to them, you want to see how God is at work in our world, transforming it, right? It's not about what happened a number of years ago in Jerusalem, in Palestine. It's about what's happening here, now, in our community. Not how God is at work through Caesar, who claims to be son of God, through the power of throne, but how God as work is at work through Jesus Christ, through the power of love. If you want to see how that transformation is changing lives, is taking place here and now, come and see how we live. Christian hospitality is about creating that kind of community, that sacred space where all are welcome and where, therefore, God can be at work. Creating such community where all are welcome, where divisions are broken down, where it does not matter if you're rich or poor, conservative or liberal, Mexican or North American, Asian or African, socialist or capitalist, gay or straight, all are one in Christ Jesus, treated equally with dignity, respect, and love. Creating such welcoming community is all about making the love of God visible, the justice of God tangible, and the transformation of God possible. Jesus calls it the kingdom of God. Paul calls it the body of Christ. We just call it church. <laughs>